Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, beautiful, short, and sweet webinar about the situation with legal tech in South and East Europe. Um, glad you could join us. It's I know it's at the end of the working day. I know it's a really beautiful summer day in most of the places where you are. Uh, but please take this one hour to listen to the biggest experts in legal tech in uh, countries such as Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, uh, Serbia, and uh, some from me. I will be the, here in a dual uh, uh, role uh, as a moderator, but also uh, I'll give a bit of information about the uh, legal tech situation in Croatia. Uh, I will not be the main, the main role here. I'll give my most of the talking to my dear panelists. And uh, we'll take a couple of minutes more to wait to, for everybody to arrive, and then we're going to start with questions. Also, if you're going to have any questions for the panelists, uh, feel free to put them in chat. Uh, we will try to find some at least 10 to 15 minutes to do Q&A and uh, to see how we can answer your, your uh, comments and the questions. Uh, also, I hope that everybody hears us okay and sees us okay. There are no uh, problems with the uh, audio or video. As you know, this meeting is streamed and recorded, and uh, there will be a, a recording available later for all of you that were not able to see the whole uh, webinar or that will need, probably need to leave. So uh, that's it. I think that uh, two more minutes, and then we're going to officially start. I actually I think that's it that we can we can start actually now. So uh, again, uh, welcome everybody to to this webinar. Uh, I'm going to ask our panelists to shortly introduce themselves. So we're going to start in turn. Uh, Ana Maria, could you tell us a bit about yourself? Yes. Hi everyone, and I'm very happy to be here. And look forward to share together the knowledge that we all possess. I am Ana Maria Draganuca Briard, and I am an attorney of law in the Bucharest Bar Association. I've been uh, an attorney at law since uh, 2014, so nine years already. Uh, I am in law tech for, uh, an, for since 2017 now, and Legal Tech 2020 when I um, registered in the ELTA as ambassador for Romania and now vice president of uh, European Legal Tech Association. I wear many hats from managing my law office to actually being a lawyer. So if I miss anything, please forgive me. I always, I sometimes even lose, uh, forget what I am. Uh, I have to change myself so many times during the day. Thank you. And I look forward for this discussion. Okay. Thank you very much. Ivan. Hi, Marco. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me today. So my name is, as you can see, Ivan Rasic. I'm from Serbia. However, I'll be sharing uh, my insights from the Bulgarian market. Um, I personally have been in legal tech since 2012-ish. Um, though I'm a lawyer by uh, education, I've been working in software companies, basically firstly a legal tech startup, and then now I'm also working for one of the providers. I'm a general director of the Sofia Tech Hub, which is a part of the SCP group, one of the legal tech providers in Europe. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to be here, happy to share any insights, answer any questions, so looking forward to it. Thank you. Konstantinos, uh, please introduce yourself a bit. Thank you for the invitation. Hey guys, um, uh, I've been an attorney at law since 2009 and uh, with an expertise on, on commercial law. And I run a local legal tech community called Athens Legal Tech since 2019. And that's it. That's all, folks. And I hope uh, I look forward to having a very productive conversation over uh, the law tech and legal tech uh, developments in our region. Thank you. 
Okay, and uh, last but not least, Surgeon. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm told that I have a terrible echo. I've tried to find the headphones, but my baby daughter uh, just took the headphones from the case and I, I don't have any headphones, uh, but it's not her fault. Uh, it's my fault. Um, anyways, I'm going to talk the lead. I'm going to, I'm not, I'm not going to talk much. Uh, so uh, I don't <laughs> ruin the webinar. In a nutshell, um, I've been in legal transformation since basically out of law school. Um, I'm working with top tier law firms regionally, globally, uh, big four companies and corporations, helping them to use technology uh, to make uh, legal processes more efficient. But what I'm most passionate about is um, how to provide legal services and make them better through technology. So client facing solutions. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of GapApp. Um, it's a uh, compliance and basically a platform that automates and scales manual legal and compliance work. Um, and um, yeah, happy to share my insights with the crew. I'm also trying to be active uh, in ELTA uh, for Southeast Europe and doing what I can on the institutional side for legal tech. Yeah, so thank you very much for being here and for inviting me. Thank you all. Okay, so I'll shortly introduce myself as well. My name is Marko Porobia. I'm managing partner of the Porobia and Spoljaric law firm from Croatia. Uh, also, huge legal tech enthusiast and ELTA ambassador for Croatia. Uh, besides being a lawyer for now almost 20 years, uh, also started have a spin of startup. Uh, we're creating one beautiful legal tech app, which I'm going to be talking about in the future, hopefully. And of course, uh, I am apparently someone who's in the know for the legal tech market in Croatia, so I'm going to try to tell a bit about it as well. So uh, let's start with, with some uh, in basic questions. So um, we all know that Southeast Europe has always been a place with mm, it's, it, it's fragmented market. It's uh, many smaller countries. Uh, there is also a sort of a language barrier between some of the countries. So I'm going to start with general question. Ana Maria, could you just introduce a bit uh, about the legal tech market in, in Romania and how is legal tech used there and developed? Sure. Uh, I would say that we are a fresh market. So if we look at bigger countries um, like US or UK, we are starting to develop the legal tech field. I would even say that it all started with, uh, the, pan with the pandemic. Uh, when everyone had to move online, so everyone had to reinvent themselves, the um, legal system had to reinvent itself, the public uh, services had to uh, reform and find a way to serve better the citizens. So since then, we, we as people and the government is trying to make sense of all this digitalization. And we, I would say that we have two pillars. We have the private pillar and we have the public service pillar. For the public service, we have a lot of projects ongoing, especially now with the new European funding. Uh, there's been a lot of projects proposed. We have in plan for the next 10 years, a lot of um, plans and um, new developments that are going to, be, to come when it comes to the uh, digitalization of public services. This is, has already started and we already have a lot of public services that you can have contact with them online, which is already good. Um, more problematic, I would say, are the um, contact or connections with the um, courts. Here, the courts in bigger cities are more digitalized and people can uh, access documentation and talk with the, uh, with the courts online in smaller uh, cities or even in the countryside, that of course, it's a bit harder. So for these new plans, we are uh, envisioning um, more, let's say on overall um, development of the judiciary system so that everyone has access to these digital tools. Um, this on the public, public part. On the private side of the road, I would see on one side are the businesses and uh, people that are using more and more um, tools, digital tools in connection with their lawyers and with their uh, providers. 
And here we have the projects of the uh, Bar Association that are trying to digitalize this, the lawyer profession in a way that would serve better the citizens, but also uh, to keep what we know as the legal profession. So this is where it is now uh, our field. And of course, not to forget about the legal tech startups, which we have a few, and we, a few of them actually even took some funding. And I was very happy to find out that we are we don't have a lot. And uh, as you said, there are some barriers here that we are facing when we are developing legal tech startups, like the language or the culture. So this is why we in num the numbers are not high, but uh, we also have this development ongoing. Okay, thank you, uh, Consta. The, how's the situation in Greece? It's always been a very specific market. So, so could you give us a really short overview and name a couple of key players? Yeah, um, we do have. Um, I would categorize in the same uh, fashion the system, like we have the private sector, and then we have the public system. The private sector seems to be endorsing uh, all this trend of digitization. I wouldn't call it legal tech per se, but I, we don't really witness any concrete or very specific change to the business model per se. So we more have like CRM, software systems, uh, legal research, some database uh, management and client case management, but nothing that uh, but this digitization process in the private sector, I would say that uh, is been going on for the last 10, 15 years. And we don't really see any legal tech boom, any major advancement. There are law firms, and we know a lot of people in major, big, uh, mid to large size law firms that uh, they keep preaching about legal tech and using uh, legal tech software. We know that they also uh, get some providers from the UK and the US, et cetera, et cetera. Some of them sound very advanced, but we don't really know the actual use in real cases, whether it's happening or not, or whether it's a fashion that they need to, you know, uh, embark on and uh, promote it as a, you know, as a marketing tool. Um, now in the public sector, uh, we have this huge injustice reform in progress. Essentially, the court case management is being uh, extended to the next years to all the courts in uh, Greece. Uh, we're going to have some digital hearing monitoring, minutes monitoring, some telematic support of trials, et cetera, et cetera. We have the full digitization also of land registry in progress. So I think we're going to have like a three to five years, some uh, big projects will be realized. And then we're gonna have like a 10 years, let's say timeline uh, for the bigger ones. Uh, that's pretty much the market here. We do have a few startups. I wouldn't call them legal tech per se. I will call them, uh, you know, general softwares that have uh, the legal segment uh, to their uh, clientele. And uh, we do have one big, uh, we do have a big one, is a music rights management software uh, that's going really big, but that's very tailored to the music industry. So I would say we have like a set of compliance, reg tech, uh, this kind of bordering, let's say, segments to legal tech per se. If we would uh, uh, define legal tech as very uh, specific to the law firm's market, to the legal services market per se, and not generally to the law tech, you know, establishment. Okay, thanks, thanks. That, that's interesting because as I, as I mentioned, that's uh, one of the issues here is uh, that fragmentation of market. So Sergeant, how does Serbia fare in that aspect? Do, I mean, you as a legal transformer, you probably have a really good knowledge of who's using what and how do they use it and what's the story behind the preaching about legal tech, you know? Well, yeah, uh, number one, I think it's important to distinct um, legal tech when you're from the position of big law. Um, I mean, we'll, we are uh, all in the uh, 
Ivan, uh, Marco, and myself are uh, managing the uh, chapter for Southeast Europe, where all the major law firms and uh, in-house counsel is is uh, have membership. Um, hopefully, we will be more active uh, now in the future. Uh, but uh, essentially, uh, we have two two sides. One side is adopting legal tech solutions from the, the from the standpoint of uh, big law. So basically, uh, a lot of these big uh, or renowned law firms are experimenting. Uh, what I like to call is the experiment uh, experiment stage or experimentation stage. Um, and we also have one solution and uh, um, obviously uh, don't want to advertise them, but one of the law firms is actually developed, has actually developed their own uh, drafting tool, document drafting tool or contract drafting tool. So we have some activities there, but on the other side, we have also a very interesting startup landscape. I've been fortunate enough to, to um, meet uh, three uh, legal tech startups just in uh, the cohort that we have in the Catapult Accelerator. Uh, GAPAP is also part of that. So we can also see activities uh, on this side. And what, what's, what's uh, interesting is that they target niche uh, industries that uh, some of them are obviously targets. Some of the key stakeholders are law firms, but some of these solutions target construction companies. So um, helping construction documentation to be uh, sorted in a more efficient manner. Some of them focus on IP, so on trademarks, uh, on, on identifying through artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, have, have there been any trademark infringements? Um, and some of them are, are focusing just on, on, on different aspects of contract and so on. And they have been very successful. Um, so, you know, uh, some of these um, uh, startups are being used by, by um, Novak Djokovic by Milka, by L'Oreal, by all these big, big brands. And I'm, I'm, I was actually also surprised because before, before the, the, the accelerator, I haven't heard about them. And which is weird because I practically know everybody and it, it's small. Southeast Europe is, is, is uh, not a big place. We all know, um, each other. And, and if you think about it, even the global legal tech scene is, is, is a village, right? We all kind of know each other. So I was pleasantly surprised by that. Um, and also seeing some action from the academic side. Um, uh, so um, seeing a lot of, when I say academic, I mean universities, uh, it, it's it's a shy, they, 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 very, they have a very, uh, let's say, uh, I wouldn't say slow response, but, um, Things are happening also in the education field. So new kind of uh, webinars, uh, special uh, study programs uh, also emerge uh, that touch the topic of legal tech. So in general, it's if you have a small market, you don't have you you can't have just like a big legal tech uh, community. But I, I see a lot of a lot of uh, thing good things. Uh, happening uh, in the next few in the in the past few few months and few years thanks Sergeant. that's very comprehensive i mean i i know you're in the know so even also do you agree with with surgeon does it is it the same in bulgaria or do you have any specific moments I, that are different i think uh, everybody has mentioned something that i can certainly relate to here locally um let, let's start from the from the macro perspective so bulgaria market um if we were to use the, you know, the delineation probably between the red ocean and the blue ocean market, right? So uh, if you would ask me a hey, back of napkin, which one of those two is Bulgaria? I, I wouldn't be able to decide, I would say neither. Um, and why so? Um, firstly, um, I, I think uh, Anna Maria mentioned that in Romania, things started maybe to accelerate around COVID time or post COVID. Um, I've been here in the local market since 2013, and I can tell you that at least for all my time here, I've seen at least the private aspect of the market, like so the lawyers and law firms, right? Interested in technology. I'm not going to talk legal tech uh, because, frankly, the further we go, the legal part is just going to fall out. I think maybe we even drop it out from the name of the organization altogether, but that's another story. Um, they've been 
interested, curious, and experimenting with that um, since at least 10 years ago. Now, it's going to sound a little bit counterintuitive, but I'm going to say next. They've been experimenting for so long, but the adoption didn't really take place across the board. I cannot really say that. I, 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 in the preparation of this webinar, because if something was happening, I would certainly be hearing about it on all across different channels in media. I just, I'm just hearing static radio noise, right? So I actually took an opportunity to catch up with, with the community here to understand what is actually happening and the adoption is along the line of, yes, law firms are uptaking products like that solve problems like CRM, you know, custom relationship management and maybe some other uh, niche tools, but the, that are tackling processes, maybe product management, sorry, project management, case management, etc. So nothing extraordinary, nothing that I haven't seen 10 years ago. And at the same time, anything else that we could possibly discuss here as fundamental, meaning that it has the potential to alter the business model of a law firm, whether it's a big law, um, law firm or more kind of a nimble startup kind of oriented law firm. I, I don't see anything like that on the market. I think that everybody here is predominantly focused on getting new business in, so obtaining clients. Um, they are interested in that part and they are observing everything that's standing in the way of that as, again, as a noise, as a distraction. So. I'm not going to argue they're wrong. They know their businesses best. I'm just simply mentioning what is the state of the market here. Now, uh, speaking of the, I'll jump into the public part and then I'm going to focus again on the vendors part and startups maybe locally here. I think that's going to be interesting to, to hear. Um, from the public perspective, uh, yeah, there have been digitalization initiatives since many years ago, I think uh, right now, what is going to come to fruition is, again, a platform that's going to just enhance how lawyers communicate with various institutions. Um, how do they perform process um, activities, meaning submissions, communications, retrievals uh, with various, again, institutions and authorities. So nothing that you haven't seen in other parts of Europe, I would say. Um, the Bar Association and their behavior likely reflects what is happening with law firms. So if nothing much is happening with law firms, don't expect the Bar Association to be pushing too much over there. Of course, they are all excited about these new digital, digital platforms that are going to come. Uh, on the side of products, now, again, I think Constantinos mentioned that there are examples of companies that are more horizontal in their technology, but could be also applied in legal. I guess you can say that for a plethora of companies here, uh, but I would like, and I, I'm not sure if I'm, are we allowed to mention names or just speak in generic terms. So uh, just in case I'm, I'm going to admit, but there is one company um, and uh, we've been happy clients since maybe three years already. Uh, by we, I mean the SPP that is located in Bulgaria and, and myself personally as a general director of the local operations. So there is one company that handles, and it's homegrown Bulgarian company, handles um, human resource processes and documentation, basically. So employment records, etc. So everything that's related and you have to, according to certain retention policies, uh, keep for a certain amount of years and you need to have the archive which needs to be protected properly, isolated, secured, all this kind of stuff. If it's on paper, it becomes a pretty big headache very quickly. Um, the guys went in and solved that problem very swiftly. Uh, the legal basis for that was found in one of the um, directives or regulations from European Union. Don't quote me there. I, I, I haven't actually research which one, but it is there. So it's not a homegrown revolution. It's something that was um, transposed from, from Europe. So they, they've seen an opportunity, they took it. According to regulation, a lawyer still must rubber stamp everything. So basically this startup was created by one law office. Um, 
I think since they have transferred ownership, so it was a successful probably enterprise and likely they have exited, but you know, um, it's a good example. So, uh, and at the same time, it is an example of what others have mentioned so far. It's such a laser focused niche solution solving such a tiny little problem uh, in the legal industry, but not solving it only for a lawyer, solving it for everybody. Every SMB or even large business could use such a platform. And um, at the same time, it's not just technology. It's not only the platform that we are talking about here. We're also talking about, if I may say so, um, in a way, we have some amount of legal services packaged right there because all the templates, all the records, or anything that you might need to run an operation with people um, have been provided by the company, which again have been, um, they've been rubber stamped by lawyers. So basically the lawyers are guaranteeing that this document should be drafted in a certain way that they are compliant, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, what would we have to do if we didn't use such a platform? Maybe not for all the documents we would need help, but in some cases, certainly we would need to cross check the drafts with our local attorney saying, hey, are these good? Are they, these documents compliant? Can we execute them, et cetera, et cetera. Now we don't have to do that for employment records, thankfully to this company that we are happily using. And I'm, I'm not going to advertise them, but if you're in Bulgaria market, you certainly know. <laughs> Who they are because they're not that many. So I would call this as a, as a one, I would say good example of what, what legal tech nowadays is because it's, again, it's horizontal in a way that it target, targets uh, basically all SMBs. At the same time, it's laser focused on one particular problem and it packages some amount of legal services within. So it's kind of scalable. So uh, yeah, I think with that, I, it might be a good point to, to, to stop for, for a moment. So unless there are questions. Thank you, Ivan. That was very, very comprehensive and interesting. I mean, I, you see, every country has actually some uh, some weird uh, particularities that need to be addressed, and they're addressed in a, in a certain way. For example, I mean, we, we're all living in an hour or two flight maximum from each other, and the differences are just amazing. Uh, I mean, I, I can tell you about... Uh, couple of things about Croatia. Croatian legal tech is mostly non-existent if you put, count out the practice management software and CRM. Uh, we have one very, very nice uh, document automation uh, project, which is out there, but it's not actually for profit. It's, uh, it's a free platform for people so they can create basic contracts for themselves, so physical persons, so they don't have to download some shady uh, uh, forms or, or any kind of templates that God knows who made them. This is actually very good and very, very helpful, but in the sense of, of uh, having a profitable tech system that's, that can be described as legal tech, yeah, not so much. And again, I, I, I'd like to hear about bit more, especially from, from uh, some of you, what actually separates this region, Southeast Europe region, or, or however you want to, want to describe it, from the rest of the Europe or, or in the world? What are advantages and obstacles that can be, that can be mentioned here, for example, whether it's, it's language, whether it's a, a demographics, whether it's a, a education, for example? I don't know. Consta, what would you say, for example, in Greece? What, what particularities does Greece have that have to be taken into account and can't be actually addressed uh, globally for Greece? Well, I can tell you one thing and then I'll let the others complete the picture for the Southeast Europe. I would say that the problem, so I'll stick only to one thing, I would say that the major problem of our region is that none of us is satellite of a greater market in legal tech and uh, thus we don't really have a spillover let's say of innovation in our markets uh, that of course is not a you know is not a solution for everything uh, for instance let's say Switzerland is uh, a lot of uh, big cities big part of it is uh, German language speaking but they don't really share the same culture 
as the Germans when it comes to innovation, it's a more traditional country, et cetera, et cetera. But generally speaking, I would stick to that observation that we're not part, we're not satelliting a big market like the UK, et cetera, or the US or France or Spain, et cetera. So I would say that's a major obstacle for our region. Yeah. Sergeant, would you would you say, for example, that that actually language and maybe I would even say that the 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 script that you're using, like Cyrillic, is a bit of a problem in 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 uh, applying tech in in your country. Um, so I would like to like distinguish two two um, different things. Uh, number one is if you're building legal tech for domestic market so for uh if you're building from serbia for serbia or from croatia for croatia i fear that there's no uh, scalable model uh to kind of support your entire enterprise uh me uh, Ivan was mentioning the hr uh, tool and scaling for example if you're uh, building that product if you want to scale to other countries uh, penetrating other markets is is not easy because you're also providing the know-how, so you need to know all the regulations from these countries. We have the same uh, similar tool here. So um, when it comes to uh, these types of uh, challenges, um, again, the smaller the market, the smaller the opportunity. Um, and also, I would like to emphasize that for low labor or low cost labor, markets when it comes to the legal industry like Southeast Europe, like Eastern Europe in general. Usually for law firms and for um, even in-house counsel, it doesn't pay off to implement an expensive um, software. It pays off more just to bring a bunch of associates that will work for peanuts uh, and build the margin on top of that. And that's the reality. And it's again, it's not, I think that's one of the difference makers when, when talking to legal tech that targets uh, law firms and corporate legal departments across Europe. Um, if it's not the same if, if you're from Finland or from Sweden, that you know, entry level salary is 6K or 5K or 4K. And then if you want to make efficiencies, the, the, the savings are substantial unlike in, in our region. So I, I think that's that's also uh, something that, that needs to be taken into account. However, that, that for example, this is what we do with GAP. That we don't focus on uh, legal system, we focus on the operations. So if you can build a tool that's focusing on operations, the operational part of the legal process, for example, compliance. And if you help uh, that, that, that basically means that you don't depend on a specific jurisdiction. And I think this is where uh, we have the opportunity as a region because um, in general, Eastern Europe, but also Southeastern, uh, Southeastern Europe, I think has immense talent when it comes to engineering. And in general, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, our, our colleagues have been uh, graduating from, from universities across the world, from the US and the UK and, and, and uh, uh, Europe in general. And I think we have the talent to make great things, uh, but I, I don't think that majority of um, entrepreneurs uh, in, in, in the field of legal tech, I, I think that they don't understand what it takes to build a successful product because the mindset of an entrepreneur and the mindset of the lawyer are totally different. Like I, I, I know stuff. I'm gonna, you know, uh, provide my services through technology. I'm gonna give money back. And building a startup, building building a company, a software company is something totally different. So um, I, I know it, it wasn't like a specific answer to your question, but I wanted to make it as broad as possible. Uh, and I sincerely hope uh, the echo is not too too terrible. I'm just lowering my voice as much as I can. No, you're good. You sound like Batman. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, thanks for, for the answer. Yeah, I, I can understand that. I mean, as, I, I, can, I can understand that the reasoning behind, you know, as you call it, cheap labor, unfortunately, that cheap labor is uh, a trouble in, in many, of, many of, of the countries, especially in, in uh, law firms in Southeast Europe. Uh, because they are now seeing a 
backlash because of that, because the best talent is not going to law firms anymore. They're going to in-house, to tech firms, to, to places that actually can value them and pay them substantially more. But that's another topic. So uh, the next topic I wanted to, to hear about a, a little bit uh, because we're so we don't run out of time is uh, Ivan, did you did you have a, a situation? Are you aware of the possibility that any kind of legal tech or tech uh, 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 startup in uh, Bulgaria or in the region is you know collecting funding or or is uh, heading for exit? In, in a substantial future? Is there something like that in, in the perspective? Um, that's a good question. So I did mention one example in my opening. Um, and again, not, not to name it, but again, I just have anecdotal evidence that uh, the stake has been acquired. Probably has been some, let's call it certain level acquisition if that was true so that he didn't, I mean, you didn't hear about it in TechCrunch or anything like that, right? So uh, the deals are likely happening where, if I mean, if you have the value and it's easy to to see such, um, how to say, such deals um, materializing. Uh, however, I think it's still very early for the local legal tech market to brag with huge exits. There's been big exits coming out of Bulgaria, um, again, big could be relative, but in terms of the local Balkan countries, 300 million exit euros, 300 million is not small. I would say it's not insignificant. And there have been a couple of such exits in Bulgaria, in Bulgaria in the last five or seven years, but mainly these are technology companies, software companies that have nothing to do with, with, with legal. Um, and as Rajan mentioned, not exactly on this point, but related. Uh, these companies are often dealing with international markets. They are not building particular tools for small markets. They are aiming big and then they get big deals and big acquisitions. Um, but one thing that I also wanted to build upon, and uh, if I may come back very briefly to your previous questions about what makes Balkan countries, Southeastern Europe, different, or what are the different circumstances that maybe induce uh, the market as is? Uh, so you've mentioned, Constantinos mentioned, uh, no big satellite, uh, no big market to satellite. Uh, Sergio mentioned perhaps the cost of labor is a factor. Um, I, I would, I, I'm thinking, I'm not sure to what extent this influences, but if you stop to think about it. All our countries have been passing through lots of changes and frequent changes in the last hundred years, right? So, um, and I would say relatively, yes, every country changes, Western Europe countries, Asian countries, so on and so forth, that is okay. But if we compare, for example, United States or UK or Western Europe with Balkan countries, let's just see how many political system changes have we all had and how what can be you know how what parallels or lessons can we draw from that now where i'm going with this um whenever you have change fundamental change like from socialism to uh, liberal markets from the third country to you country uh, etc whenever you have changes of, of that magnitude you always have a lot of work for the legal sector right and i would i would say I i'm not saying that the legal sector in other countries does not have projects enough to do i mean all the statistics show the opposite but uh, i'm i'm just kind of wondering if the frequency of changes that we are seeing if it somehow influences um uh, and basically gets us to the position that we didn't have anything, how to say, tangible developed, tangibly developed here in terms of legal tech. I mean, we are, markets are small. And I would say if you are really building something that has a potential to address only the local market, then you don't have too many choices. Um, the example that I spoke about, the startup that I spoke about, again, it may seem as a small market in geography targeting all um, 
SMBs in Bulgaria for now, uh, of course, unless they decide to scale out as well. So yeah, I, I, I will think. I would think that coming back to your uh, first question, so just to summarize again, I didn't see any large deals. Of course, fundraisings are always possible. Not all of those are public, uh, but I think that we yet have to see uh, situations like we are able to see in other countries or maybe in our countries as well, but in other markets like big acquisitions, big deals, uh, anything noteworthy and worth uh, writing home about. Uh, we don't hear you, Marco, just a note. My apologies. Uh, I was muted. Ana Maria, uh, we, there is also this one actor that's always been a bit present, in, especially in, in, in the ex-communist countries in Europe, uh, that loves to have a lot to say about anything that's happening in the legal sector, and that's the National Associ Bar Association. So what is the position for example in in romania what what does the bar say about the new tech that's coming in uh, how does that affect them do they find it to be do, are they curious are they uh, uh, you know defensive are they supportive how does it work so yeah as as we know bar associations are very present in our life but i wouldn't say necessarily here in southeastern europe uh, as we talked with our colleagues, we found out that they're extremely present in Western uh, side of Europe as well. Um, let's say it like this. Again, I will come back to what I said in the beginning. After the pandemic, everything changed and everything had to reinvent it itself, even the legal, uh, legal services and even the bar association. So if before that, you know, the discussion of digitalization were lacking. I mean, you know, the legal profession had maybe other things to deal with. Uh, starting with uh, the COVID crisis, we had to do something because our own existence depended on that. Uh, and I would say that from that moment, the necessity of digitalization started to, to be more uh, concentrated and more present in our life. And even the Bar Association uh, started to feel this need. And because the request came from uh, the market, they saw that it's not necessarily just a nice to have addition to the life of lawyers, but it's actually a, an important characteristic of legal services. The people were demanding that legal service are uh, delivered faster, better, uh, in an easier way. So because of that, there has been um, some strategies drafted for the digitalization of profession, some points that, uh, let's say, show the direction of where our profession in Romania wants to go. Uh, however, because still digitalization is a very hot topic, there's been a proposition of law that was not really in line with the strategy that was kind of voted by everyone. So the, um, it had to be withdrawn. There were a lot of uh, lawyers that uh, were against it. So for the moment, we are probably rediscussing a new law uh, in order to apply this strategy that it is there. It is there and it is a good one. It, it's good for us, it's good for the people. And I think this is how we should look at legal tech. We shouldn't look at it only as, you know, digitalization of lawyers or at public services for the good of one party, but uh, it should be seen as the good for everyone. Legal tech should be, it's here in order to improve legal services, in order to bring legal services closer to people, in order to make access to legal services easier. If you don't have that, for me, legal tech uh, doesn't fulfill its purpose. So yeah, it's, it's, it's hard as, uh, as my colleagues were saying, because you know innovation is expensive. So we are small markets and it's hard to, um, to get the return on investment on this innovation once you make it. So it's harder to have a, a view on the future if you want to innovate in, um, in law. But I think that in the same time, because we are usually late on everything, like we know we are the last, last ones on the table when it comes to every development, at least what 
I saw is that we learn, we learn and we implement very fast. Uh, because as Ivan was saying, we, we went through a lot of changes. We all learn how to adapt very quickly. So one good point, because you were asking also about good points and less good points, is this, that we learn how to adapt. We see the others, how they implement it. And when the moment is right, or a bit later than the moment is right, as we are always a bit late, we um, go quickly and we implement it. So I think this is what happened also with the Bar Association in Romania. We were a bit late at the table, but now uh, we are there. We see how others do and we try to adapt quickly. Okay, thanks. Uh, Consta, how is Greece in that aspect? I know that sometimes Greece is, is, is known for its bureaucracy. Is, is your bar the same? Yeah, I, I mean, give, yeah. I mean, on top of Ivan's comment on uh, the radical change in uh, the political uh, regimes in, uh, in our region the last decades, I would say I would view it in a different direction. I would say that we have the same uh, culture. I mean, we don't have the same culture, but I would say that probably that's an explanation as a general uh, um, uh, as a general opinion on the societal changes. But for the technology and the legal tech per se, I would say that we we mostly have the continental approach unlike the Anglo-Saxonic approach. So I wouldn't say, so I wouldn't uh, pinpoint uh, the political change per se, but I would say that Spain, France, let's say Germany and a few other markets are big markets because there are big countries with industry and tech, big tech companies. So I would say a combination of, let's say, market structure, meaning a lack of big tech companies that would influence big law firms and then etc in a circle of influence and uh the continental culture doesn't allow us you know to innovate a lot so in that fashion i would say that national bar association here is uh resistant to adoption they in public they usually endorse but when it comes to actual take uh, uh, to issue a pertinent judgment on that and a directive, et cetera, or an official opinion, uh, uh, they decide otherwise. And I'll give you a very specific example. On the December of uh, 2022, last December, they issued a statement, an official statement, the assembly of all the bar associations of Greece um, a very negative and hostile statements about the use of telematic uh, uh, use for the administrative law trials, not the civil and the commercial and the panel, et cetera, et cetera, which we, which we could discuss, uh, you know, on certain aspects, but on the administrative law. And that's like a few months ago. Uh, so I see a major difference, uh, a major uh, difference in the approach between the government, which I would say is more pro-tech than the bar associations themselves. So I'm hopeful that probably some changes like the use of telematic uh, equipment and software in certain court procedures will be realized regardless of the bar association's opinions. And I hope that's the case because it doesn't really make any sense not to use on uh, this kind of trials, which are really uh, not very hearing centric trials. These are like, you know, usually you have the position, you submit the pleadings, et cetera, et cetera, and that's it. And probably it's a yes, uh, yeah, yes, your honor, blah, blah, blah. And maybe, maybe an examination of some witness in very, 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 very few cases. So I would say that we have a, a very, not very hostile, but, you know, they preach this, but when it comes to actual uh, statement, the Bar Association is not very pro-tech. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I can just give a 30 seconds about that example of how Croatian Bar 
is actively fighting against uh, against the introduction of anything that's even remotely you know non standard there there there's some weird weird uh, uh restrictions in our in our marketing and website uh, rulebook where it says that we are not allowed to have any third party links on our website except a link to our bar association website so they, and and also it's forbidden for us to have a two way communication on social networks which you know and we have the same yeah we yeah same. because because but it's all over know. europe it's not only yeah. us it's yeah, a continental the, thing yeah. i mean it's not a south and eastern europe thing it's a continental thing that you know the attorney at law is uh, the barrister etc you have these restrictions you're not allowed to yeah, but but the, the, public the or point? become I mean, like a you know better call so billboard kind of advertisement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know, I'm not against. I think it's, against, a, I think it's yeah. a major issue inside European Legal Tech Association, and it's not an SAE you know particularity. If I'm allowed to say. Yeah, yeah. I have no, I have no idea what what what's the, their issue, but whatever. Anyway, uh, we have eight more minutes, so I'm going to ask a final question. This is going to be for all of you, so please keep in mind, uh, try to keep it under two minutes so that everybody has their two minutes to, to finish up. So uh, with, with the, the advent of generative AI and everything else that's happening, can you give us uh, your perspective on how the legal tech will develop in this region in the next five to 10 years? Let's start with Surgeon. So, uh, Um, yeah. Okay, so here are the facts. Um, eBay is solving around 60 million uh, disputes with their software uh, a year. Uh, in more than 160 uh, countries, there have been uh, remote hearings uh, for court proceedings. Um, all around the world, things are happening, right? Uh, when it comes to South, Southeast Europe, it happen, it's, it's happening slower, but it will happen because the market is connected. The world of business is connected. Um, I, I wouldn't look at the Bar Association and regulators as, as the center of innovation, but if we're talking about systematic approach, private sector will be governed by money. So if we're talking about lawyers, they will need to adjust if their clients ask them to adjust. And for courts and for government, uh, changes in, in the government and court systems, this can be only done from the top of uh, political power. So uh, courts will not change by itself. Uh, it, it will be changed by uh, a certain law or a, or, a, or a certain demand from the high political power. and. Technology is not something that's nice to have. It's must to have, it, it's a must have, and for obvious reasons. So when it comes to five years, I think it's super long. And uh, I think that um, Southeast Europe will have to, <laughs> it's, you know, most of the countries are in the European Union. So it will have to cope with all the changes that, that that's been happening. The law will resist, but, it, the, the the technology will prevail at some point. So this is this is my two cents on the topic. Okay, thanks, Ana Maria. What's your view from from Romania on that aspect? Yeah, here I would say, like Surgeon, I will look at the private sector as one pillar and public sector one pillar. Private sector uh, will adopt this type of technology much faster. We've already adopted it. Uh, the stage to text, the drafting of documentation, uh, everything that will help us bring the legal service closer to people and solve their issues. Businesses, they want our solutions and our services fast. We don't have time anymore. Everything is on fast forward. So because of this demand, um, us as lawyers, we will have to uh, adapt some way or another. So. Uh, I wouldn't even say that in five years, I would say that at least for the private sector, the adoption is going on and in one, two years, 
businesses that want to survive will have to uh, adopt this uh, type of technologies. Uh, on the other hand, the public sector, which is a bit more slow in general, for us, at least in Romania, in 10 years, I just see these plans implemented that will mean just digitalizing all uh, courts. So, you know, digitalizing at a very low level of, okay, we will have a digital file and everyone will be able to uh, access their files there and send documents. So not something extremely special. However, I read the strategy of development from the High Court of Cassation, and I saw somewhere there that they want to implement a speech-to-text AI uh, to, um, to draft the, uh, the court hearings uh, from, uh, from, the, from them. So I think, you know, if public services and higher institutions adopt this type of um, technology, the people around and the rest of the society will adopt it faster. Okay, thank you. Uh, Consta? Yeah, I'm um, sharing the same views with the, uh, with the previous ambassadors. Uh, on top of that, I would add that certain procedures, uh, legal, uh, whether uh, uh, they take place between peers, between private people, or you know, in relation to a court procedure, etc., will probably be eliminated in a ten to in a five to ten years uh, timeline. So I really believe the landscape will be entirely different. I'll give you one example, and that's from me. Uh, if you are uh, if you have an underage uh, kid and uh, you uh, you want to uh, uh, you as a parent you want to renunciate the inheritance let's say of your mother or etc cetera, etc cetera. you need to go to the court you need to do this you need to get a license from the court or blah, blah blah if you have digital and if you have databases of the entire system meaning that the tax service uh, the court system etc that has an intra communication so you get an update who renunciated what etc you don't need to go to the court etc cetera, etc cetera. so so i believe on top of what the other guy said that we're going to see a lot of procedures become obsolete and i guess that's a that's a great thing okay and uh even your last close yes i'm going to be slightly more conservative than the rest of uh, somebody said five years is a long time span but um if somebody told me 10 years ago, then today I'll be looking at a more or less the same landscape that I'm looking nowadays. I wouldn't believe them. Uh, of course, everything, lots of things can happen in, in five years, in a year even. Um, uh, speaking of AI and the use here, uh, again, I think if anything happens, the private sector will be the driver, primary, primary driver, obviously. Uh, I, I feel that local lawyers observe a technology at large from the fundamentally pragmatical perspective. And I think it's normal, they are running businesses, that's okay. So I, I, don't, I don't think and I don't see fear, fears or fear mongering of AI replacing lawyers, anything like that. If anything, they are more likely to observe um, a generative AI as a pen uh, versus you know some other form of writing that was coming before pen, et cetera. So I think they're gonna observe it that way, again, from the pragmatical standpoint, to what extent it's gonna get adopted, I guess um, it will all depend what level of use they see for coming from that. So I, it's hard to say um, cost of labor or macroeconomic uh, conditions could do its own stuff here. Again, if something um, radically changes, then maybe, you know, they're gonna be um, reluctant to just outsource everything to people and associates. Maybe they go more towards technology. But again, it's tough to say again, five years, maybe too much in the future, but in 10 years, much didn't change here so far. So let's see. Okay, thank you very much everybody for, for participation. Thank you panelists for being so uh, open and comprehensive about uh, the answers of, that we had. Um, more or less, my conclusion is that, yes, we are a bit different, but again, we are the same as, as uh, related to, to the legal tech uh, situation in Europe. And there are maybe more, more uh, startups and more, more uh, scale-ups in countries with a bigger 
bigger companies uh, with the bigger markets, but that doesn't mean that we're not able to create uh, uh, something really good. I think that things are going to go uh, forward. I do believe that in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see uh, one quality startup rising arising from from uh, this region and uh, probably even an exit or at least a sale to some of the bigger players and uh, all in all my suggestion to anybody who has any intention of developing legal tech go for it don't stop take your time and everything so i see we actually have a raised uh, yes, hand Marco, here. hello yeah. hello uh, everyone i'm paul stoika from romania hi. from nl i'm hello. Uh, let's say an ai enthusiast so John, already knows us because we had, a, we had a legal transformation program here in Romania hosted by PricewaterhouseCoopers last year, we finished it. So I have one question for, the, for all, the, all the panelists regarding the new AI regulation that it seems to come to an end this year and also at the end of this is expected to enter into force. So we will uh, have one regulation apply uh, applicable to all the to all the um, 27 member countries so um regarding this i would like to ask you all what would you think that uh, um, the impact will be on the on the legal tech regarding the, this new ai uh, regulation that will come from uh, from the european parliament do you think that this regulation will help in this field or on the contrary will not and we'll have some more issues and, I don't know, maybe other, uh, I don't know, constraints regarding the, the development of legal tech. What do you think? This was my question. So. Okay. Who's going to start? Do we have a, do we have a volunteer? Yeah, maybe I can shoot. Hi, Paul. Yeah. Uh, Hello. Hello. Amazing, Sarah. amazing seeing you again. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, just just look at GDPR. So, uh, it, uh, on one side, it made it uh, let's say more difficult to do business, uh, at least when processing personal data. Uh, and I, I, regulation is all, always has that effect. However, look at the gazillion GDPR tools that are you know like one trust and. Obviously, they, they, they are the big ones, but GDPR tools that are used worldwide. So it's also an opportunity for um, lawyers and also entrepreneurs across the world to kind of uh, utilize utilize that as an opportunity. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were tomorrow if there were tools that would help companies be compliant with the AI Act. So it's always when it comes to legal tech, it's all, it's always, I, I think more regulation means more opportunity for uh, tech solutions, at least okay. in my opinion. Thank you. So, so you, you will see it as an opportunity for further developments rather than a, I don't know, a constraint to the development. Well, it will be a constraint for all AI based solutions in a way, right? But if we're talking about regulation and legal tech, uh, especially being from the compliance uh, side, I can see this only as an opportunity to, to maybe find a better way to help companies cope with the AI Act and the framework. So, and again, more job for lawyers. Yeah, good, thank you. I think I can concur with Surgeon here. Um, if you observe the society at large as a uh, under the, let's say, scope of a law of fluids from physics if, uh, to the extent that we can remember. So if you apply a little bit of a pressure here, you feel an effect over there. So it's same with regulation. Regulation from one side will curtail or restrict to some extent development or what AI should be able to do or anything. But at the same time, I, I do agree that it could, uh, for creative minds, pose opportunity for developing lots of niche businesses that can uh, leverage on top of said regulation. Um, and yeah, cost of compliance is always going to skyrocket. It's not <laughs> nothing new there. So we'll see. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would I would just say hi, Paul. I'm happy hi. to hi, meet Maria. you. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say necessarily that would, you know, affect legal tech directly in a way. Uh, it would have the same effect as any tech. After, yeah, it's true, it will have an effect on us as lawyers, on our work, on how do we try to keep our the businesses that we deal uh, compliant. But on legal tech, I would see that it will bring exactly the same, let's say, uh, opportunities, 
or uh, more constraints as any other tech that would try to implement any AI. Mm -hmm. okay. I share the same views with uh, with Ivan and Shredian that you know, on the contrary, it would uh, propel and fuel an entire compliance industry. So probably you know, in some aspect, legal tech like uh, free loose cannon, do whatever you want, supercomputer probably won't be the case. But again, you know, if you put, you know, if you put a set of rules, then you're going to build on that. So it's probably a de facto, you know, new kind of design that uh, will propel, uh, uh, besides the compliance, will be designed on that uh, set of rules. Okay. But it's very early to see. It's very Maybe we will see. see some, I don't know, legal tech startups that will do comply AI compliance for AI companies. I don't know. <laughs> Although there is already in the US. Yeah. No, 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 here. Like it's here Fiddler, for the, for the new regulation. It's Fiddler AI and mm. uh, yeah, I'm I'm on the board. More. Yeah, I, I have more. to give a I have to give a, a, a I'm going to be devil's advocate here. Now I I am in generally in, in favor of some regulation of AI because of course. If you don't regulate it, there will sooner or later be bad actors who will use yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. But definitely. on the other hand, I, I fear that it doesn't turn into the uh, standard phone charger rule. You know, it, it was published today by European Commission that they have uh, ensured the st new standard on of phone charging by proclaiming USB-C the holy charger. And my question is, okay, I invented something much better. And it's illegal. What do we do? Well, because you, yeah. can I give you, a, can I make a prediction that um, in order for the big ventures, don't want to do a name dropping here, but in order for the big ventures to promote their suite of tools, of AI tools, I think. Uh, the big political establishment like the EU, the US, et cetera, et cetera, they will issue a set of rules and then they will have probably some uh, uh, AI compliance tools. But I'm not entirely sure that these AI compliance tools on behalf of the states can essentially unlock the black box and map it in its entirety. So I think they will find a technical way uh, in order to, you know, assign the liability to, let's say, a big player and say like A, B, C, you take the full responsibility and they don't really, you know, gonna get to the algorithm and um, map it into the, you know, in its entirety and explain it in human language, et cetera. So I think that's a prediction that I can make. Okay. But also, it will be it will be a very good way to find um, Meta or Google for like two billion. Um, I, I just this is something that I've I'm always doing when when delivering um, training trainings and and doing general research. So. Uh, regulation will be more digital and is getting more digital every single year. So it's every legal problem is not a legal problem anymore. It's also a technical problem. Starting with privacy by design by default, starting now continuing with the AI Act, you have DORA, uh, uh, Digital Operations Resilience uh, Act, also have like uh, uh, Mika and so on and so forth. So legal norms, will have to be implemented in computer systems. This is something that that's, that's you know, law will become self-enforceable. You won't even have a, a choice of, of infringing in, in, in some states and in some instances. That's Smart true, but, and everything else. but I'm not sure you can, you can re-engineer what, let's say, OpenAI did. No, that's why course. you see a lot of people, yeah. because you can say that you cannot allow selling let's say, you know, Ethereum, et cetera. That's very simple. But you cannot re-engineer what OpenAI did on a technical level. So you're not entirely sure how the black box works. So that's a whole different game here. So, I mean, can EU essentially do a due diligence to the algorithm? No. In my opinion, no. They can only 
apply a set of rules and say that you know if a b c you are you must be complied on these and then you take a responsibility so i think it's a responsibility liability insurance game of uh structure here because i don't really believe i mean i know a lot of technical people and they cannot comprehend how open i did what they did yeah of course but it's it's always a, a game of cat and mouse you have wall street and you have the sec right you're always trying to be smarter than the other person and for example if the european commission says okay i'm going to pay two million euros per year uh, for an ex open ai engineer and I'm going to pay some uh, of the best engineer in the world to crack to, to, for example, to give an audit, code audit. I know it's like it sounds like yeah. science fiction, but it's always uh, a game of. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, guys. Sorry, guys. We, we yeah, uh, we need to to end uh, the webinar <laughs> now a bit. We started talking uh, uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, we just need a drink and start having a you know. <laughs> A casual conversation but uh, anyway i would like to close this up as we have uh, passed our time for 12 minutes uh thank you very much for all of you who stayed and remained until the end and past the end obviously uh thank you paul for your question uh thank you all the panelists for being so patient and then being so so great in your answers i hope we can uh do another iteration in a couple of years and uh first we're going to check this recording and see how right or wrong we were. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, see you soon live somewhere on the beach, I hope.